Thanks, Will. And we'll follow up um, in, a, in an email with information on how to uh, receive one of those free analyses that Will just talked about. So any, the email address that you signed up with for the webinar will be what that goes to. So be on the lookout for that after this. Uh, we've got quite a few questions in the q and um, Just a side note, my internet has been a little iffy. We do have um, Kai Street on the line. If I go away, she will jump in and it'll be like nothing even happened. Um, so just to start out, um, Rand, I want to I wanna uh, give the first question to you. So when we talked about um, those buckets that you have, so directly harmed, directly benefiting, indirectly affected, uh, do you, would you say there are more efficient channels uh, or marketing focuses depending on which bucket you fall in? Yes, but it's not universal. Um, I, I think I, I, I saw the meme the other day, right, that uh, internet marketers are basically just, you know, our duct tape is, it depends. <laughs> and that is that is certainly true here as well. So, you know, if you're in, uh, we can go, back there real quick. But you know, if you're in these different, uh, let me share the screen. Yep, that one. Right. So if you're in this um, directly, there we go, right, directly harmed, directly benefiting, indirectly affected, uh, I think it is, it is certainly true that for directly harmed, the raw pay, per, pay for performance, pay for conversion channels you probably either want to shift those to pay for pent up future demand, meaning get people to come to you and give you their email address or like sign up for something in the future or get, get on your newsletter, subscribe to your blog, whatever it is, right? Like get them in your future audience. If you're directly benefiting, that's probably actually where you want to invest because those costs are way cheaper, right? The, the CPMs have fallen, the cost per uh, click has fallen. And so you can take up some of that demand that the rest of the economy is left slacking. And if you're indirectly affected, uh, I think you got to just figure out which channels keep working for your conversion and which channels you can use for pent up demand. But, but ev almost everyone can take advantage of lower ad costs and higher online attention to invest in either organic or paid. It, it just depends. Stop the share here. Awesome. Really, thanks. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Rand. Yeah, Will, do you have anything you want to add on to that? No. No, I think Rand pretty much nailed that. <laughs> <laughs> Rarely do I just go, no, I think he nailed it, but no, I think he nailed it. Uh, so, Will, got one coming for you. Um, and Rand, actually, I think this is uh, a good follow-up uh, from you would be appreciated as well. So, do you think that organizations without enough data on their own to be, let's say, like statistically significant can take advantage of broader consumer data to make educated guesses on what kind of content, products, brand promises, etc.? And if so, where would you suggest they go and look for that data? Fish, go for it. Yeah, sure. So um, let's see. Again, depends on who you are, but there's almost always data available to you. I, I think one of the smartest things that you can do is if you are early stage or very small, you can look at data from bigger players and providers. Um, one of the ones that I like a lot, many of you know that um, for the last couple of years, I've been working with this company, JumpShot, uh, which provides clickstream data. They were shut down in January, which is tragic because anonymized aggregated data is everywhere now in the age of coronavirus. And if they had survived another 30 days, I think they would have been huge, which is sucks. Uh, but similar web has kind of picked up that uh, strain and similar web provides some extraordinary data, uh, much of it for free through free reports uh, and a good amount that you can get through their paid pro product, which is fairly expensive, but can be really worthwhile. Uh, you could subscribe for like a quarter or six months or something and get a lot of data that way. Uh, there's also industry reports and competitive data that you can get from a lot of uh, um, trade aggregators. But to be honest, my favorite data, I think the data that's most useful to you very early on is what I talked about earlier with the surveys and interviews, right? That would be my baseline for everyone. Go survey a few hundred people, right? If you can capture a few hundred of those, 
Uh, if you're having ch a challenge reaching those, find the influential sources, get them to amplify for you, whether that's paid or organic through outreach, whatever. Um, Joel Kletke, by the way, had an extraordinary tip on Twitter this morning that I absolutely loved, which was, if you are having trouble breaking through to an influential source, a publication or a person, go subscribe to their newsletter or their blog, and then send a reply when you get the get their their like email right so you go subscribe to the spark toro blog you get an email when we publish you reply with like oh i love this this is really great hey could you help me out with blah 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 the guaranteed response right like it, you you have created a relationship it, it, it's perfect so uh that would be something i'd use on that survey side and then you want to have some of those in-person interviews because that data um is extraordinary and and then you could layer on similar web stuff as well well, I mean, like uh, the reason why I pointed to you on that one, Fish, is because uh, like I know you've just dealt more with the jump shot data set. So if I don't have my own, because I'm very like, I, I, I don't know, it, it, I tend to think like the hard part about broad based data is take a non HubSpot company and then that competes with HubSpot. You could be like, oh, I have this data that says in position two, I can do this. And it's like HubSpot just does more with that second position because people like them more than they might like you. Um, Amazon, like when you see them ranking, it's like, oh, they might be number five, but like, I know I'm gonna get my stuff in two days most of the time. And like this company, eh, maybe not, I, I, it's more risky for me and I want it quickly. So like, there's so many nuances that are playing with people at that time that that's why I just personally just love to get my own, which is not what the person asked, right? If you can't get your own data, then I think that what Rand said is the, is the best way. Well, um, this is, like, Will, you are, you are hitting it exactly, right? If you're competing against big company in your space already and you're a smaller player, I think you have to find that emotional story that speaks to the small audience that you serve better, right? Like, hey, those big banks suck at joint checking accounts. They don't even use the word joint. They're not showing two people. They're not uh, LGBTQ friendly and look at us like we are, like whatever it is, right? Uh, those things are those are great ways to identify like gap in the market and I'm gonna serve small audience that's better for me than HubSpot is, right? So you serve, you look for those people who um, are missing an experience and then you, you sort of serve them. You know what's interesting is uh, Nora and I were chatting uh, the other day and I was saying all, all these people that are buying like box stuff, like box stuff, uh, a box of fish we got some like weird seafood oh, yeah, thing yeah, delivered, yeah. right and it's the like dog food shipping right yeah, boxes yeah those companies might get a little overconfident right now like oh look at us like blah and it's like no actually what you need to do is take that survey the hell out of your customers and then learn how to pivot your marketing in a world where i can just go get the fish now you want me to you want to remind me that like you work with local farmers, that you support local farmers, that you do these things that I might really care about because you better have a hook to bring me in later because eventually convenience will win again. At some point, all that stuff I felt so great about and supporting local and buying my local thing is gonna be like, yeah, but Acme or whatever shopping market's like right there, you know? So, um, so I believe like surveying these, if you're growing right now, surveying the hell out of your customers to understand what makes them tick, understanding yeah. Here you go. Understanding what publications they follow, understanding what freaking think, what podcast they listen to. You understand them at a deeper level. All of a sudden your marketing can attach to that, which is going to give you more staying power after all of this is hopefully over. So this is from this website. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the website first. Uh, Kettle and Fire. They make bone broth in Austin, Texas. Uh, I use them as, a, as an example in Spark Toro. And they uh, do this really cool thing. They've changed their messaging, right? So they're like, stock up so you're prepared at home, right? Blah, blah, blah. But check out what happens when you buy from them. So I bought on mobile. I ordered a bunch of um, stock because Geraldine and I really liked it. So they have this survey that you get right after you check out. And it says, how did you hear about us? Which blog publication, like if, if you click which blog publication, which health influencer, like so, so smart. Ask right at that time, like after the conversion's done, but before they've left, this type form survey pops over and they, they just get extraordinary data from this. Um, and, you know, obviously SparkToro can, can help with a bunch of this stuff too, but it was just so smart to me that they were collecting this data 
uh, and then using it for their future marketing because they can really get inside the mind of their audience. If you, even if you don't go pitch these, right? Even if you just like pay attention to the same sources your audience pays attention to, you understand your customers and what they're like getting in their world, what's being talked about in a way that your competitors don't. This is something I think small businesses can do so much better than big ones. Oh my God. So Fish, um, one of our clients was like, if everybody has the same information and keeps throwing it into Facebook's algorithm for like uh, lookalike audiences or whatever, at some point, if I don't find a new data sort to add in to my data to get very different lookalike audiences, we're all kind of competing with each other for basically the same thing. Okay, so great, I sell shoes. I need to know size, I need to know gender. Great, I'm gonna upload that into Facebook for lookalike audiences and sure, there will be some nuances there, but at some point, every shoe seller is selling the same stuff. Whereas if you have another data set that you're also laying your, layering in next to those things, Facebook's going to be much more different and more efficient for you than everybody who's like, oh, female, size six, upload, look alike, everybody, right? So yeah, no, um, the, the, the stuff you're talking about there, I never thought about that until a client said it to me once, like, I like your data because I can take these people also ask questions or these other things and load them into this other thing and create very different audiences than my competitors can. And I was like, let me take a note on that. Thank you. Yeah. Super smart. Super smart. All right. We're going to have to go with some lightning round for this Q&A. All right. Sorry. That's good. Here's a pretty, here's a pretty quick one. Um, any survey platforms you recommend? Uh, I have used Typeform because I saw about 20% more completions on it than when I used SurveyMonkey. That being said, SurveyMonkey has gotten better and um, Typeform there's a few things that you can't do on the analysis side. So I, I generally switch between Google Forms for really like cheap, free, like easy stuff to plug in, uh, SurveyMonkey for more complex, big picture stuff, and then Typeform for like really, really friendly, small number of questions, great on mobile. And none, none for me. Uh, Teresa would be the one to know all that. <laughs> we can just send it out in the... Uh in the in the in the notes from whatever she would recommend awesome sounds good uh and we got about 15 minutes uh left so we have oh, a, a decent yeah we have a decent amount of time um i really like this one it's not actually a, a question but i'm going to turn it into one um so will's presentation makes me think that in order to be a smart ppc specialist you've got to have a very good basic of seo um and knowledge about search intent right so well, can you talk a little bit about how you've um, kind of merged those at SEER and in the work that you've been doing? I've tried. I mean, I, I, I mean, I lead by example. So I went and got my AdWords cert, right? Like I was like, I'm going to go and get AdWords certified. Like if I expect my PPC team to do it, you know. Um, how valuable my, did you find it? It grounded me in shit. There was stuff like, so Rand, after I took the AdWords cert, I was like, wait, you get every search term that you spent money on in AdWords, just like, because honestly, Rand, like our whole industry went ape shit when not provided happened. Literally, people went nuts trying to find ways to, re to bring it back and to come up with adjustments. And nobody on paid was ever like, Psh, guys, we have it all. Like we know at least what the words were that people were showing up for. You got to pay for it. But if you got paid, like we got it. I never heard that. And I spent two years hearing people talking about not provided. So it was like basic things that were inside of AdWords. And I was like, holy crap. Like, how did I not know this? But for me, I think the bigger thing is, um, and, and Nora sent me an article a while back from somebody in the nonprofit space around power to the generalist. Yeah. In down economies, so like we have different divisions that are getting hit in different ways. Some are growing, some are slowing down. The people that stay in their silo only, it's like, well, too late. Like you didn't learn these things. So therefore I can't transfer those skills over to this division that's growing because it's too late. So yeah. I think the big thing is um, in general to be a good marketer, understanding how different platforms work, help you to figure out the connective tissue between them, which I think is critical. You don't, you don't want me running your page but you want me to understand what paid data looks like so I can figure out how to do all my other jobs better. Mm -hmm. And if push comes to shove, 
I can do paid if that's what's growing, right? Because I can get through it because I've done the, the work to learn about it. So I'm a big believer in these kind of markets and this kind of times being a little bit general, knowing how to write a good piece of content, optimize that content, and then throw it into an audience for Facebook to get some visibility to it. And then to know how to analyze your own data to figure out how to tweak it to make it better versus having like four different people, a Facebook person and an analytics person, and an SEO person. I think it's good. Yeah. I think it, I think I think it's valuable, especially at these times. It's job security. Like you get to be like, oh, wait, wait, Aaron did it. Aaron was on marketing and she was like, you know, I used to be like this baller in Google Analytics. Well, she didn't say that, of course. But um, she's like, I used to be this baller in like Google Analytics. Like if you need help over there, like sign me up. And it's all of a sudden like, yeah, of course I would. Right. So I think that that's super important for people to try to think for future proofing their own risk in their careers. Sometimes it's helpful to try to be a general enough that you can shift between two different areas that the companies you might want to work at may be likely to have roles for. Hmm. Rand, anything you want to add on there? No, no, I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it, that reminds me of a, of a, a plug, a pretty good book I read recently called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World by David Epstein. Um, pretty, pretty good one for anyone out there wanting to dig in a little bit more on generalists. Cool. So uh, next one we got here. Um, how much of your marketing should be retention based with current clients right now and customers versus acquisition? So I'll, I'll open that up to either of you to start with. I take a little bit of a, um, of the opposite view of, of how a lot of folks think, which is I, I think there's a ton of focus on retaining customers right now. And I, that's not wrong. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, but I think empathy demands that we recognize that people's, that some people are affected very, very differently than others, right? So I, I showed how Zoom is, you know, like up a thousand percent, two thousand percent, right? And Gumroad's up and Shopify's up. But Carnival Cruises, they, they, they cannot afford to pay you right now, right? They don't have the budget for it. Your local restaurateur does not have the budget for it, right? Your local retail shop doesn't have the budget. So recognize that if you have customers, if you have a diverse set of customers, some of them are gonna be massively affected and spending all your energy focusing on retaining the whatever, 20 or 30 or 40% of your customers who are like, I have no money nothing's coming in. I'm shut down for months and probably will be affected for years. Trying to get them to keep paying you the same amount is a lost cause. Um, instead, I would focus on recognizing who are our best customers who are surviving and thriving in this environment. Let's go find more people like them that we can help, right? The people who are, I don't wanna say easy to retain, but easier to retain, Let's use them as a specific customer cohort now. Go identify more people like them. Go find the sources of influence and attention that reach them. Go do marketing in those places. Maybe that's search, maybe it's social, maybe it's paid, whatever it is. But that's, that's where Casey and I are focusing our effort for SparkToro, right? We basically recognize like, oh, we got punched in the mouth. Like half of the customers we thought we could get for SparkToro, they're never going to sign up. Right? They just don't have budget approval anymore. They don't, they've, all their corporate cards have been pulled. They can't go spend anymore. Let's go find the industries and people who are uh, affected positively, right? Whose demand is growing and they have to go get more online attention. We're going to go market to them through the next, you know, three to six months. You know what, Fish, I wanted to disagree with you on that when you started off. But like, you know, as usual, I was like, eh, yeah, oh shit, dude's got a point. Like, it makes a lot of sense. You're right. I mean, you know, I think that's the saddest part, like outside of growing the business, because who gives a shit, right? It's like, it's more like when you're across from a client and they're like, I wish I could continue to work with yeah. you. It's yeah. just like, it's just like gut wrenching when someone's like, I love you, but there's literally the, so either I can, either I can fire that person right there and keep your contract or I can keep that person's job. You're like, I get it. I'd be like, I'd fire me too, right? Like cut my budget, come back in the future. So I love, I don't know if you saw this, but um, Buffer did a really smart thing around this. They basically saw that a ton of their customers um, couldn't afford to pay them. And they were like, no, if you're having trouble paying, here's three months free. Stick with us, your same plan. We're doing good anyway. Like we we're growing. Here's three months for free. We can afford it. 
you just take it. You don't, you don't like forgiveness. I, I think that's so awesome. And look, uh, if I'm a Buffer customer, I'm not going to complain that someone who's hard hit is getting it for free and I'm not or what, like, screw that, right? This is, these are extraordinary times and so extraordinary measures have to get taken. And I think, um, you know, I was on the Moz board call, was that a couple weeks ago? And Brad Feld, one of the investors in Moz, um, suggested that, that Moz do something which a bunch of software as a service customers, companies have been doing, which is essentially to say, hey, right now, like if you have a contract with us and it's like a long-term big contract, we can do a very large prepayment discount. If you call us and are basically like, hey, we're worried about if we can afford or if we can re-up, just be like, okay, cool, got it. Uh, if you wanna pay whatever, 15%, 20%, 30% of the normal price will grant your contract for the next quarter, next six months, next year, whatever, so you can stick with us. And I was like, oh yeah, I get it, right? That makes sense. It's good for the business now. It saves the customer a bunch of money. The people who really need it can still get it. Like it's sort of a, and it doesn't um, create this problem of, I think part of you know, the sales team at a lot of SaaS companies are like, yeah, 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 you can, don't worry about paying us right now. You can pay us in 90 days. And then in 90 days, it's like, oh man, our cash collections looks crazy uh -huh. and we're not getting any of those dollars. So that's really nice. I love those guys. Yep. We are happy buffer users over here at Sear as well. Um, so, Will, this one's kind of specific to the joint bank account example that, okay. that you gave. Um, how, how do you think they're ranked first? Uh, and I think this can kind of go back into the engram analysis and things of that nature, but how do you think they're ranked first if there's no mention of the actual word joint in their content? Got it. So in this world, um, we are talking about paid and organic. So we have to be clear. Um, all those people were paying money to get those clicks, which is why it's really frustrating because it's like, why pay? to drive somebody to a page where you don't even mention the word and you don't even talk to them in their own language. Um, the technology is too good to allow that to continue to happen. Um, however, what I will say is um, simple is probably talking to people in the right way where if they just put the word join, see, this is the power of SEO. Oh my God. It's like you guys nailed it right? You've got the right words. You're going to have longer engagement on the page because it's actually what people are looking for. You use together and them and us. And, oh, let me look at how you can protect your, your, your significant other from seeing that you just bought them a gift at a place. Like they have all that functionality built in the app, but they will call, they keep calling it shared accounts instead of joint, which means they're missing out on probably millions of dollars in account opens. And because they're joint accounts, they're probably larger account opens. That's another reason why mm -hmm. people should not be bidding for the word checking account. You, God damn it. It's like so fucking basic. If you take the fucking engrams and split them out and you get your shit straight, you start being like, wait, these types of customers end up opening accounts with a lot more money. Therefore, I should separate them because that word drives a different type of customer so I can bid and rebid and retarget them differently than the average checking account customer. But alas, this is why we have jobs, right? Um, but so, yeah, if I was simple, I would just add the word joint all over the page, joint slash shared, and then they would probably rank in the top 10 for it. So uh, can, can I ask a question? If, if the question, Aaron, was uh, why does Google ads show these non-relevant people who don't even mention joint, who don't mention shared, who don't have, yeah, yeah. So, so my guess is it's two things, right? They're paying more money and also their other ads perform well, right? So like that, whatever, Chase Bank or whatever, and Google combines it all. They're kind of like, oh, Chase, you do well in bank advertising. So we're going to push you to the top, which basically like for simple is a message of, oh, so if I expand my ads and I do better micro targeting across every kind, I am also going to rise in the paid search rankings. Is that what you've seen? Well, so, so I, I was with you up until the point on simple. So are you saying that simple, if they see Citibank at the top, that simple believes they will be rewarded by making the small tweaks to try to outrank them in the paid results? 
Uh, no, so basically Simple could see, oh, whatever, Chase or, or Citibank is up top. They're probably up top because they're so big. They have such a huge spend with Google across the board and their ads tend to perform well. Maybe in this joint checking case, they don't perform well, but they tend to perform well. So Google's putting them up there. So if we simple start expanding our ad buy uh, and getting and having higher performance in each micro segment, we too will rise up and be able to compete with Chase and Citibank. Is that not true? So the problem is with quality score and the way that it's managed, as I understand it, right? So part of it is how much you're willing to pay. So as a result, if Citibank is willing to pay like 15 bucks a click because they just have more money than God and Simple's got to be a little more smart about it, they might go, well, if I tap out at seven or eight dollars per click, even though they have a higher quality score because they're better connected right. with what people want, um, the willingness to pay so much, that's what Google tries to say is Google says, hey, if you want to show up for this word, man, be my guest, but we're going to make you pay through the nose for it. The problem is when we go into a world of smart bidding where they go, hey, just put in the word checking account and all of our machine learning will do all the smart matching and whatnot. It's like, wait a second. Like, dude, one of the reports that we run for clients is we look at how many unique search terms landed on one PPC page. Holy shit, bro. I saw a client who had $2.2 million spent and 52,000 unique words going to one PPC landing page. And that's not, that's not atypical. But yeah. it's not a report that Google gives you, and it's not a report you can get out of any tool that I know. And then the kicker is when you join the PPC and SEO data rand, you then just go, wait, you already ranked number three for it. So it's all sitting right there in my singular view. I can go, okay, you got all these words, these 50,000 words going to this one landing page and paid, but, it's, but you're ranking in the top 10 for 5,000 of them with like 18 different pages. So yeah. like you need to... Stop driving the traffic to the page that doesn't answer the question. You've already earned the right right over here. But that oh. shit just doesn't exist. So therefore, um, that's why we do what we do. Like, that's what we yeah, try to no, do is find those inefficiencies. So well, right? yeah. yeah. So anyway. Cool. Ah. So that oh, is we a just good... stay on and just riff. <laughs> it's been a while, Rand. I haven't seen you at any conferences or anything. I know, I know. We, we got to hang out. <laughs>